How's it going, smart people? My name's Dylan, I'm a physicist, and on the weekend, I went and saw Tenet. And if you've seen Tenet and didn't understand it, well, you're not alone, I didn't get it. But what I did get was the physics, and the film was all about physics. There were lots of physics things going on. I don't think you could really understand a lot of the plot if you don't actually know some of the ideas that uh, Nolan was exploring. Um, and there's not just one complex theory involved in the story. There's quite a few and it sort of merges them all together and makes a lot of assumptions about reality and they're never even explained in the movie. So that makes it even harder for the viewer to understand. So I'm not going to actually explain the plot of the film, rather I'm just going to explain the physics the film explores because it explores a lot of complex theories in physics and if you don't have a good working understanding or just an interest in physics, you might have had a hard time following. Now, if you haven't watched that film yet, maybe don't watch this video because there probably will be spoilers ahead. Maybe, maybe not. I don't really know what I'm going to talk about. I'm just going to be randomly going on about what I remember from the film and some of the physics behind it. So I saw this film and it was all about physics. When I was leaving the cinema for Tenet, I was actually sitting out the front waiting for someone in the toilet. Um, thinking about the physics of the film. And I noticed my uh, advanced electromagnetism professor walked past, which I thought was hilarious because he was probably the only other one in the cinema who had any idea what was going on because as you're gonna see, there were some really complicated things explored in this movie that most people just don't know about. Now, before we get into some of the physics, I'm not gonna go crazy in detail with physics, just I'm gonna go over some of the basics. Um, thought this could be a good idea for a video and a bit of fun because the film is a lot of fun um, to think about, definitely. So one of the central things this movie plays around with is the fact that all the known laws of physics uh, don't have a preference for the flow of time from Feynman to Einstein to Dirac to Bohr, Maxwell, all of those rules that those guys laid out they don't have a preference. Um, all of the equations they've described work equally as well for the forward direction of time as well as the backward direction of time. There is one law, however, that seems to have a preference for the flow of time, and that is the second law of thermodynamics. Uh, that law is that entropy always increases. So we'll come back to the second law, but let's talk about entropy because that's what the whole movie is kind of based around reversing entropy, which they call inverting in the movie. So whenever you see entropy described in pop sign, it's always described as the measure of disorder in a system. But this actually isn't that correct. It is in a sense, but not really. So what entropy actually is, in a more accurate sense, is a measure of the number of possible microstates of a system in thermodynamic equilibrium, consistent with its macroscopic thermodynamic properties. I'm not going to explain that. You know, if you want to understand what that means, do a course in statistical mechanics, course in thermodynamics, course in quantum mechanics, and then it all eventually comes together um, in a back grad school. So entropy is related to time via the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy for an isolated system must always increase. And an isolated system being like the universe, a closed system, you know, like a refrigerator. We'll come back to that. An example of this is coffee. So when you're making a coffee, you have your milk, you have your coffee, and then you mix them together. Before you mix them, you have a low entropy state. It's highly ordered. Not really, but just think of it that way, right? When you put them together, there's more disorder, right? They mix together and you have a high entropy state. So you never see a coffee unmix. Do you? Even though there's a probability of that, it's so low that you'll never see it, but you just don't see that, right? And this suggests there's a flow of time, there's a direction, an arrow of time. Another example is like a glass shattering. You drop a glass and it shatters into a million pieces. You never see it go the other way, do you? A million pieces to form a glass. So this is where people get confused and tend to think that entropy and time must be somewhat must be the same thing, essentially. So time and entropy seem interchangeable, but they aren't. You can reverse entropy, and in doing so, you're not reversing time. Time still 
flows in the same direction. So that kind of just disproves the whole thing. That It's also known as Maxwell's demon, but the way I'm going to explain it is a, just a more condensed version. So like I said, a refrigerator, it actually reverses entropy. You can put, say, liquid in it, a lot of disorder, and it freezes into an ice cube, which is much more orderly. And you've reversed entropy for that closed system. Technically, what you've really done is just put the entropy elsewhere because entropy always has to increase for the isolated system, which is the universe. But for little pockets, closed systems, you can reverse the entropy. Really, you're just putting it elsewhere because for the entire universe, it will increase. So again, for that closed system where you've reversed the entropy, did time suddenly start going backwards? No. And this is what disproves the connection between entropy and time and kind of makes the whole movie redundant. But anyway, as far as we can tell, the second law of thermodynamics is true. As I was just talking about, the entropy of the entire universe always seems to increase. That seems true. It also seems true that time always goes in one direction, which we say is forward. What many don't seem to appreciate is that there seems to be two types of arrows. The thermodynamic arrow of entropy and the perceptive arrow of time. During inflation, where the entropy of the universe remains low and constant, time still runs forward. After the last star has burned out and the last black hole has decayed, time will still move forward. And everywhere in between, regardless of what's happening with the universe and its entropy, time will move forward at that same universal rate. If you want to know why yesterday is in the past, tomorrow will arrive in a day, and what you're experiencing right now is the present, well, you're in good company. Thermodynamics, interesting as it might be, won't give you an answer. As of right now, in 2020, time is still an unsolved mystery. So what about relativity and quantum mechanics, I hear you saying? Well, they do present ideas of what time is, but they oppose each other. They present oppo completely opposing ideas of time. Which one's right? Well, probably neither. I think space-time is doomed and quantum mechanics needs revising. There's things it's probably missing. And that's kind of heresy to say in physics. Um, but many people just haven't read enough. Now, if you take time to be entropy, which it isn't, then time simply owes its existence to the initial conditions of the universe. And you can use it to predict the future. The universe is expanding and increasing in entropy. So what does a high entropy universe in equilibrium look like? Well, nothing. Uh, all the stars will eventually burn out, all the black holes will decay, and there will be absolutely nothing. Just land of high dark energy and high entropy. And it seems like that is where we're heading. Now, some believe that at that very point, time will have disappeared. But that's not correct, because time and entropy aren't the same thing. Time will still march on. Tenet assumes that entropy and time are the same thing. That when you invert or reverse entropy, you're going to invert time. And like I've just explained, that's not the case. There's also another more subtle assumption here that the movie makes. And that's, sorry for the beep, and that's that consciousness and the laws of physics are somehow separate. <laughs> They're assuming that consciousness is not controlled by the laws of physics. If it was, it too would be going backwards. Now, what I think consciousness might be, which is probably not, but it might just turn out to be a bunch of complicated interactions in the brain. There's nothing mysterious, nothing unknown going on there. Um, and what I mean by that is you've got the 100 billion neurons in your brain, um, and you've got electrical signals, pulses, doing these complex circuits around your brain. Um, you know, if you have 10 neurons, and you're doing complex circuits, that's like 10 to the power of whatever. It's incredibly complex. And I think those complex circuits will turn out to be what thoughts are. Might not be true, but we're almost there with machine learning. So I think that could be on the right track. Okay, back to time. Let's continue our discussion of it because there's more to say. So what about relativity and quantum mechanics? Let's talk about time in those theories. Einstein determined that time is woven together with the three dimensions of space, forming a bendy four-dimensional space-time continuum, where space and time are essentially the same thing, space-time. 
which is referred to as a block universe, encompassing the entire past, present, and future. Einstein's equations portray everything in the block universe as determined from the initial conditions. And surprises do not occur, they only seem to. Just before Einstein actually died, and that's I think like 1955, he wrote, for us believing physicists, the past, present, and future is nothing but a stubbornly persistent illusion. That timeless, predetermined view of reality held by Einstein is still popular today. Many physicists still believe this um, because it is predicted by general relativity. Now, if you're scratching your head thinking, I thought Einstein told us that time is relative, not universal, that different observers, as long as they're traveling at different speeds, experience time differently. Whether two events occur simultaneously or one before the other depends precisely on the observer's point of view. If you watch Interstellar, one of Nolan's earlier films, he actually uh, does a great job of giving you a good idea of uh, relativity and time dilation. I'm actually writing a sci-fi book on it at the moment. You, you can find it on my channel, Luster. Um, so if you're into sci-fi, check that out. Well, time is relative, but just for things in motion. What it has to say fundamentally about time is this concept of the block universe. Now, if you ask someone to reflect a bit more deeply on what a block universe means, they'll start to question and waver on the implications of such. Physicists who think a bit more carefully about time point to troubles posed by quantum mechanics, uh, the laws that describe the probabilistic nature of particles. At the quantum scale, irreversible changes occur that distinguish the past from the future. A particle maintains simultaneous quantum states until you measure it, and then it takes on one of these mysterious states. One of the weirdest things about quantum mechanics, in my opinion, is that even though individual particles and ensembles of particles, they follow statistical patterns, individual measurement outcomes are unpredictable and completely random, very bizarre and mysterious. So this inconsistency on the nature of time in quantum mechanics and relativity has caused a hell of a lot of confusion, even amongst physicists. Now we'll come back to uh, the concept of time in quantum mechanics. So let's go back to relativity for a minute and explain why the Bloch universe must be wrong. So in relativity, everything is predetermined. All of what will unfold is determined by the initial conditions, which means that those initial particles must encode all of the information that will unfold. And that means you need an infinitely many digits, infinitely many digits of precision uh, encoded in those initial conditions. Otherwise, there would be a time in the far future where the clockwork universe would break down. But information is actually physical. Modern research has actually shown that it requires energy and occupies space. Space itself has a finite amount of uh, information it can hold, uh, the densest of that being in black holes. The universe's initial conditions would require far too much information crammed into any given space. It just isn't possible. An infinitely large number just can't be physically relevant. The Bloch universe assumes the existence of infinite information, and I don't think that's physically relevant, and it must fall apart. In conclusion, we don't really understand time currently. If physicists are ever truly going to understand the mystery of time, they have to grapple with not just Einstein's space-time continuum, but with the fact that the world is truly quantum in nature, ruled by chance and uncertainty. Quantum mechanics paints a very different picture of time than relativity. The inconsistency between relativity and quantum theory underlies the struggle to find a quantum theory of gravity, a description of the quantum origin of space-time, and to understand why the Big Bang happened. If you look where we have the paradoxes and problems in physics, they always boil down to this notion of time. So I haven't explained time in the picture of quantum mechanics yet. Time in quantum mechanics is rigid and unbendy. Um, it doesn't merge with the dimensions of space, like relativity. Measurements of quantum systems in uh, quantum mechanics make time irreversible. Otherwise, 
it's completely reversible. So time plays a role in this thing that we don't really understand yet. Many physicists interpret quantum mechanics as telling us that the universe is indeterministic. For example, if you have two uranium atoms, one decays in say 500 years and the other decays in a thousand. And they are completely identical in every way. In this picture, in every meaningful sense, the universe is not deterministic. There are other interpretations of quantum mechanics though that manage to keep the classical deterministic notion of time alive, like the many worlds interpretation, which is the one Nolan assumes to be a reality in Tenet. These theories cast quantum measurements as playing out a predetermined reality. Take many worlds for instance. Every time there's a quantum measurement, the world branches. It splits into both. Um, so say I have a cappuccino or a decaf, I have to decide. However, that's not a quantum measurement, so that's not really the same thing. But pretend it is a quantum measurement. Really, what will happen then is there's a world where I have a cappuccino and a world where I have um, a decaf, and they're completely disconnected. It is also assumed there'll be infinitely many branches in which all possible outcomes will occur, and they were all set in advance. This is actually where the multiverse uh, theory comes from, because it's implied if there's branches of these realities out there, what else are you going to call it? Tenet assumes that the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is correct, which it probably isn't. And then it incorrectly suggests that every time uh, a quantum measurement happens in reality branches, that you're somehow in the same place. And now there's two of you. That's not what it suggests. Anyway, that's enough about time and entropy and why Tenet got it so wrong. Tenet assumes that time and entropy are the same thing, which they aren't. You can reverse entropy and time would still go in the same direction. Okay, so we've talked about time and entropy, which is all but flawed, the plot of the movie. And we've also talked about why there shouldn't be all these people running around from branch realities in the same place if many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics is correct, which it probably isn't. So that's another problem. Oh. And it also mentioned uh, Feynman and Wheeler's theory that antimatter is just matter traveling backwards through time. So you've probably heard of an electron. Well, its counterpart, its antiparticle is the positron. Um, and they suggest, yeah, that it's traveling backwards in time, which if we don't really understand what time is, it's kind of a throwaway theory, really. Um, there's, not really much evidence to suggest that it is. So that's another thing the movie also assumes. Um, that Wheeler guy also did put forth a theory, um, I think it was called One Electron Universe or something, and it he assumes that every electron in the universe is the same electron, whizzing backwards and forwards through time, um, and that makes up every electron you see. So I think Tenet has actually taken this hypothesis and just run with it, which is a little bit absurd, but it's very cool to see it explored in a movie with like $230 million budget. And weird things do happen, like we currently think uh, that photons don't experience time because they're massless, so weird things are possible. So let's relate this to the film a little bit. So every time they invert, are they suggesting that they're creating this antimatter version of themselves? I mean, I don't think so, but they did talk about how they come into, if they see each other, the whole world would be annihilated or they'd be annihilated. I can't quite remember, but if that was the case, then I think they're implying that. So antimatter is a very real thing. Um, it's constantly around us. Um, you get matter and antimatter popping into existence and annihilating at like 10 to the negative 34 seconds, which is almost instantaneous, but it seemingly comes from nothing. Um, but not really, because even if you have nothing, you're still going to have a quantum field. There is this weird thing how there's more matter than antimatter in the universe, and no one knows why. And you might be like, well, how do you know that? Well, look around you, you know, everything's made of matter. Whenever you bring antimatter into the world, it almost in immediately hits a normal piece of matter and annihilates. Or by annihilation, they meant simply because there would be a paradox and 
the events that needed to happen wouldn't happen and everything would go boom because there's a paradox i don't know what else was there um the movie also brought up the grandfather paradox um it's a paradox so it's not really worth explaining because i can't give you an answer to it because there is no answer it's a paradox and no one currently understands what time is so no one can okay i think i'll leave it there that's enough talking about all the problems uh i have with tenet's physics uh, I do highly suggest seeing it. It was amazing. I loved it. It was uh, really thought-provoking. You really have to think a lot. You come out of the cinema, you have to think a lot if you want to understand anything that you just saw. Um, so go see it. I highly suggest any one of you guys who are really into physics, you don't often get to go and see a movie where all these complex theories are provoked. So anyway, that'll do for the video, guys. I'll see you next time.